Good afternoon. I'm Lori McDonald, Vice President for Student Affairs, and welcome everyone to our um, first Reframing the Conversation of the Year on a very historic day in celebration of Martin Luther King Day. And I would very much like to acknowledge um, that this land, the land upon which we uh, regularly gather, but um, are gathering in spirit virtually today, is named for the Ute tribe. It is the traditional and ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute tribes. The University of Utah recognizes and respects the enduring relationship that exists between many indigenous peoples and their traditional homelands. We respect the sovereign relationship between tribes, states, and the federal government, and we affirm the University of Utah's commitment to a partnership with native nations and urban Indian communities through research, education, and community outreach activities. It is my pleasure to introduce uh, Vice President Jason Perry, who's our Vice President of Government Relations and Director of the Hinckley Institute of Politics, who uh, the Hinckley Institute is our partner for this program and many of the programs for Martin Luther King Week. Jason. Uh, thank you, Lori. It's so good to be with you and everyone else. I'd like to congratulate and thank uh, Vice President Marianne Villarreal and her team in the Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion for the partnership we have. The Hinckley Institute of Politics is so happy to participate in the annual Martin Luther King Jr. programming. Also want to thank the MLK Planning Committee. You're doing amazing work, EDI, and so many other campus and community partners that do so much for what is going to be a really great event today. Today, we're going to be exploring Congressman John Lewis's call for good trouble, as he called it. As we discuss the current state of civil rights in the United States, I can't think of a better legacy to honor than Congressman John Lewis and his persistent fight for equality from a student and community organizer to a venerated member of Congress. Through his life, he embodied the mission of the Hinckley Institute of Politics, demonstrating very well that you're never too old or too young to fight for a better world. We encourage students to get involved in elections and politics, to intern with the organizations that are shaping policy, get involved, help improve our communities. Today's forum, Reframing the Conversation, Good Trouble, and the red line will explore the intersection of race, power, and geography, and how government policies have been used to harm people of color. This is gonna be a great panel today, I have to tell you. And Congressman Lewis was right. Sometimes we do need a little good trouble. And we're gonna talk about that a little today, but I want to first introduce our moderator. We're so glad to have you with us, Jenny. Jennifer Mayor Glenn is going to be our moderator today. I just wanna give us a couple things about you because you've been involved so much, Jenny. Jenny is the new director of the University Neighborhood Partners. She served as the director of family school collaboration at the Salt Lake City School District, working to build uh, authentic family school and community partnerships focusing on underserved communities in Salt Lake City. She was an administrator at Glendale Middle School, Mountain View Elementary and Community Learning Center. She also served as the alternative language services coordinator and language and cultural coach for the Salt Lake City School District. Before that, she was an ESL and special education teacher. When she's not working for social justice, which we appreciate, she's doing community advocacy work with the Utah Coalition of La Raza and working to increase the number of Latinx teachers and administrators with the Association of Latino Administrators and Superintendents in Utah. Jenny, you come so well qualified and your panel is amazing. I turn it over to you. So glad to have this conversation today. It's important, it's timely. Thank you so much, Jason, for the introduction. Um, it, a, a little while ago, I was uh, I watched the uh, inauguration of President Biden, and um, I kind of feel like a cloud has been lifted off Washington, D.C., and certainly I feel lighter. But what I heard was a call for the healing of the soul of America. Um, today, I hope that we can understand a little bit better um, a tiny piece of why that soul is bruised. Um, I'm excited to be moderating a panel of such powerful women today, and um, thank you so much for being here, and we'll introduce you all in just a moment. Um, but first, a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, the first thing is, is, if you have questions, please add them in the Q&A box. We won't be checking chat for questions. Um, 
And also mention, also we have an ASL interpreter and closed captioning options if you need those. Um, so yes, questions in Q&A. Um, so first I'd like to introduce our panelists. Um, first is Sidiak Alvarez Valle. You can wave there, Sidiak. Sidiak um, is passionate about bridging policy and grassroots um, efforts to build a better world, especially for children of color. Her work as a grassroots community organizer and her faith continues to inspire and inform how she sees the world. Sidiak is currently a policy analyst at Voices for Utah Children, and her policy work is focused on children's health coverage, community health workers, immigrant rights, juvenile justice. She graduated with a BS in political science and sociology from the U in 2017. Um, she was born in Cuernavaca, um, Morelos, Mexico. Cuernavaca is a beautiful city, city. I, I hope you get to visit often once this is over. Um, but she's called Salt Lake City home for almost 20 years. Um, Ashley, Ashley Cleveland. Um, Ashley is ecologist turner, turned city planner. Um, as a millennial of color and new mom, she has always cared about um, equity and what that means for the places we live. She thinks representation is key in so many important workings of our everyday life. She serves on the board of directors for Curly Me, a nonprofit serving black girls and their families. She's on the board of trustees for Tracy Aviary, um, a governor's outdoor recreation advisory board member, Utah's only outdoor Afro leader, and she manages a promise program in Utah's youngest city, Mill Creek. Thank you for being here, Ashley. Uh, Fatima, Fatima Deary, if you want to give a wave. Fatima is the Senior Policy Advisor on Refugees and New Americans um, for Salt Lake City, um, to the mayor of Salt Lake City. Um, she was born in Burwana, so Somalia, and raised in Kenya and Utah. She received a master's degree in social work from the University of Utah. Fatima is passionate about advocating for human rights and social justice issues, empowering women and youth to be leaders and educating people and refugee populations. Thank you for being here, Fatima. And finally, and, and not least, <laughs> Francie. Francie Taylor um, is the director of the Youth uh, American Indian Resource Center, where she leads the center's mission to advocate for American Indian and Alaska Native students and serves as a vital link between them and the U and the larger community. As a mother of two, grandmother of five, and auntie too many, Francie has always wanted the best for others. She has dedicated the last 25 years toward increasing access for all underrepresented students in American Indian education. Thank you all ladies for being here. Um, this is uh, an important day, I think. Um, I'm hoping it's a, a new beginning for us in so many ways. Um, but we are here today to talk about um, redlining. And so I wanted to just give a brief um, uh, definition and kind of uh, and take it back to sort of our history here in Salt Lake City. So redlining is a discriminatory practice by which banks and insurance companies, among other industries, refuse or limit loans, mortgages, and insurance coverage with specific geographic areas with high populations of people of color. Um, and this is a now um, an outlawed kind of uh, practice. However, um, I don't think it's something that has really gone away completely. Um, I would like to share that uh, there's a, a quote that I'd like to give out of um, in the Salt Lake City Weekly written by Realtor Babs DeLay. I don't know if some of you may know her in June of 2020. She said, Salt Lake Mayor Mendenhall um, reportedly keeps an old map of redlining at her desk. And I've actually seen this map. She does have that map there. The maps weren't just unique to Salt Lake. There were 238 cities that used these maps as a guide to where home loans should not be granted because of high risk. Here in Utah, the map specifically noted where Negroes lived, which were areas that were coincidentally redlined. The best neighborhoods where lenders easily gave out loans were Upper Sugar House, property around the University of Utah, the Avenues, and Sugar House itself. The main red areas where lenders were advised against granting mortgages were Rose Park, the West Side, Papa Grove, Liberty Wells. Um, and 
Additionally, um, my own personal history, my uh, great uncle was not allowed to purchase a home in the Marmalade area. So in the West Capitol area, he wanted to buy a home there for his mother and he wasn't allowed to. Uh, so this is something that has been present all across the nation and really, frankly, the world. So um, for our first question, I'd like to invite uh, Fatima and Francie to answer this question. So redlining, which is now against the law, presents itself more in more implicit ways. Um, how does redlining present itself in 2021? Um, and let's start, actually start with Francie. Francie, you are muted. I'm sorry, I just saw that. Uh, I wanted to start off by also giving my introduction in my native uh, way as Kasawasit Kita Paha And redlining is ancient, it is extremely ancient. And it went from legal to insidiously hidden. I mean, a government can, can create a red line and then outlaw it, but that doesn't go to the point of where the citizenry destroys that invisible line. Uh, I'm from Montana originally. Montana, at the turn of the century in 1880s, had a very vibrant, uh, exciting African-American community. Out of the 1,300 people in Helena, Montana, where I own a home, almost 400 were African-American. They had newspapers, theaters, stores, restaurants. It was a very vibrant community. In the early 20th century, redlining became apparent and they started drawing lines. And by the 1930s, there were no black establishments left in Helena. In fact, across Montana, uh, it was redlined against most people of color. Uh, Hispanics, American Indians, absolutely. Some people would say that our reservations are redlined, but they are sovereign individual governments. And, and we say that that's just a little bit of our land that was left. But we had what were called sundown laws where people of color could not be in any of the major cities after nighttime based on the supposed threat that they posed to the general populace. Today, if I'm moving in today, if you want to know if redlining continues until this day, take a trip from Idaho all the way down to St. George on I-15 and count how many exits and on-ramps go in and out of the west side of the tracks. Then come back up and find how difficult it is to exit on 600 and get all the way into the avenues. This isn't an accident. This was done by government planning as to the more white upper class neighborhoods increase the difficulty from anyone to get into that neighborhood and then back onto the interstate. It exists today in many ways, most of it um, underground so you don't see it. An uncle of mine tried to buy, borrow money in Montana to buy a car. And it wasn't until he legally changed his name from an Indian sounding name into one that looked Anglo, did he get the loan. So thank you very much. Thank you, Francie. Fatima, same question. Uh, yes. Um, so I grew up in Rose Park. Uh, for many of you who are not familiar with that, it was the west side of Salt Lake City. Um, coming here as a nine-year-old, I just remember some of the things that we have to um, live by as being a minority, like getting to the hospital. The closest clinic was the Redwood Clinic University, um, which is you know, at least 30 minutes away, as well as the biggest hospital, University of Utah, located in the east side of Salt Lake. So for me, I just kind of wanted to reflect back some of the inequalities that hurt a lot of minorities, given that the redlining was banned about 50 years ago. Um, the law was passed, and still to this day, we can reflect some of the 
pattern that we see in economic and racial residential um, segregation that's still evident in many US uh, cities. Um, looking at Salt Lake City, for example, um, many of the neighborhoods that we um, oftentimes hear about, West Valley, Rose Park, these are neighborhoods that are uh, minority, you know, minority led. And so a lot of them are economically disenfranchised. A lot of them don't have access to the same opportunities that many um, neighborhoods like Draper or Sandy are, are, are provided to them. And so for me, I take this issue into, um, it's good thing that we remind ourselves what, what has happened with redlining neighborhoods in the South, in the West side, as well as uh, today to look at largely some of the minority groups that are unable to become homeowners, they're unable to get bank loans or their credit um, is deemed due to their ethnic background, but they don't understand why that is. And so for us, we need to historically recognize that. So for me, working for Mayor Erin Mindenhall and for her to have this map um, available to us to review and also remind ourselves some of the hazards that were created and how do we go back and um, make sure that the policies that we are um, implementing and the things that we're evaluating are not only equitable, but the structure of racism is still in existence in today. And so we need to evaluate some of these things and what do we do going forward is really important. Um, as, as was mentioned by my colleague, um, uh, Francine, is if you just wanna understand how the redlining has affected many of our neighborhoods, just take a drive through some of these neighborhoods that I have highlighted and mentioned and see the impact that it has on many of these communities today in this day and age. Um, racial inequality, policing, um, racial injustice, all of these things are in, fa in, in fact affecting a lot of minorities and people of color a lot more in extreme ways. And so we, we need to be more desirable and we need to highlight some of these stories in ways that we not we don't go back in history. We you know do some good trouble. We move forward and we um, change some of these policies and procedures that are in place that is affecting all of us. Thanks, Fatima. Um, we'll go on to question two, and this is for um, Ashley and Sidiak. Um, in March 2018, the Washington Post published an article titled "Redlining Was Banned 50 Years Ago. It's Still Hurting Minorities Today." What has been the impact of redlining on you and your family? Um, well, uh, thank you for having me. My name's Ashley. Um, I will go ahead and, you know, speak to what Fatima and Francie has mentioned on how it's presented itself, right? Francie brought up how entries and exits to freeways um, are mostly uh, towards BIPOC communities, Black, Indigenous, people of color um, communities within cities. What that means for my family and my community is that we usually have higher rates of asthma and other diseases that are connected to environmental factors. Um, Fatima brought up how we haven't had access to bank loans and um, economic opportunities because they're not available on our side of town. What that means for myself and my family is that we still have a larger hurdle to getting over the eight generational wealth gap. Um, especially for the African American community, our uh, wealth gap has tripled since 1968. Um, our generational wealth is about $24,000 in comparison to white communities that have about $120,000 to pass on to their next generations. Um, when we look at family health outcomes for myself, my daughter, and other people in my community and my family. Um, one scholar called Mindy, named Mindy Thompson Fully Love, talks about how we have, you know, higher rates of hypertension, diabetes, lower access to food. We live uh, healthy food. We live in food deserts. Um, these are things that are impact our daily lives and, you know, make it harder for us to live healthier um, lives because it's not available to us, not because we are not working hard or, you know, have the education um, available to us, like someone like me who has a master's degree from the U. Um, we still have a, a lot of things that we have to deal with. Um, 
One of the other things that, you know, Fatima mentioned in regards to safety, if you look at a lot of uh, instances where we've experienced uh, civil unrest this past year, if you were to overlay that map with redlining, you would see that a lot of the cities where these um, instances are happening are in communities that also have been redlined and left out in the cold and um, left out in the cold in regards to redlining and filling those equity gaps because of city budgets and things of that nature. So that's something that definitely impacts myself and people in my community. And then lastly, um, I would probably bring up uh, health outcomes for our children and pregnant mothers. Um, asthma is a, is a real thing for us. And new CDC data has shown that uh, people of color and especially black women are three to four times more likely to um, have uh, preeclampsia and other things that negatively impact our chances to having a healthy uh, pregnancy and childbirth and lead to high mortality rates. And that's something that directly impacts me and people who live in my community. Thanks, Ashley. Sidiak. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for letting me be on this panel with such wonderful panelists and moderator. Um, again, my name is Sidiak. My pronouns are she, hers. and. You know, as I was thinking about this question, I was thinking about a um, piece, an article that Jenny shared with us. Um, it's called The Gathering Place by John McCormick, if anybody's interested. And there is a, there's like a small sentence in there from a person of color who mentioned that they were, they were not allowed to go to Liberty Park, um, the pool at Liberty Park. Um, and it really struck me because I've grown up in Liberty Wells and I've gone to that park so many times. I learned to like ride my bike there and I, um, my family would go there all the time. And so it's just like in this very moment, like I can feel the history of that redlining and that discrimination and like the reason why I want to continue pursuing social justice and not only like thinking about the healing or the things we must do but the things we must repair um, when we talk about redlining and we, when we talk about discrimination and racism that has been historically embedded in our city like in Salt Lake City not just like in our country but we see it like in our own very neighborhoods and so as I'm thinking about like how uh just how redlining has affected my family. My family, most of us immigrated to the US in the early 90s or early 2000s. And so we haven't really seen the like impact of the actual redlining, but the legacy of redlining uh, in, in, our, in our experience. And, and most of that has been and not and still not being able to obtain uh, to buy housing. And as we know, housing or buying homes is, is one of the major ways that Americans are in this country, we create wealth. And so for my family, only like two or three of um, my family uh, members have a home, the rest of them rent. And when we think about renting, I was actually like finding a new place recently. And um, I was looking at all of the different requirements, right? Like of not being evicted, of not having all of, not having any criminal background, having a good credit score, all of these things that we know um, that are important, but also know that there are higher rates of people of color and people in um, the West Side communities who have higher policing. So when you have more policing, you have more criminalization. We ha when you have more criminalization, you have more, right, like instances of having a misdemeanor or a felony or all of these charges. And so then you have a less likelihood of getting um, apartments or places that are cheaper or in better neighborhoods or um, generally just being able to find steady housing. And so, uh, for my family, it's been um, largely the the impacts of the legacy of redlining that have affected um, how we see like ourselves and our family. And then also, um, I'll just end with this. And the, I was talking to a fam a friend um, when we were both we both happened to be at Sugar House Park, uh, and we were you know I was walking my dogs and they were jokingly saying, well, there's no parks in West Valley, so we come here. 
Um, and like all jokes aside, right? Like that's actually true. The the green spaces that exist on in Sugar House or on the west on the east side, there are so much more opportunities to go hiking to be outdoors than there is on the west side. Um, and that is one of the reasons why I, I am actually like very excited for uh, Mayor Mendenhall and the work that she's doing, uh, because I know that planting trees is one of the one of the things that she has outlined in her plan. And I think, well, I think that's beautiful because I, I do think that, you know, when we talk about redlining, there are so many things outside of just housing um, that, you know, Ashley, Francie and Fatima all um, outlined that are just as impactful to the way that we live. Um, than just, you know, buying a home or not being able to buy a home. Thank you, Sidiak. Um, okay, this next question is for Francie and Sidiak again. Um, so according to local historian John McCormick that you mentioned, Sidiak, thank you. Um, in the 1960s, the Central City uh, Community Council organized a Residence Code Compliance Committee um, and they founded People Against Redlining to fight against the common practice of banks and savings and loans of not providing loans to residents of undesirable inner city areas. How have you and other people you know fought against discriminatory practices like redlining? Francie. You're muted. I apologize. I'm trying to not let any of my noise around me bother. I apologize. It's a daily chore. I mean, it's it's making calls to legislators. It's talking to community members. It's standing up and speaking out. It's not tolerating the segregation or our elimination of any community. For me, Personally, I think it's it's a personal stance that I take that I don't tolerate anybody being pushed to the sides. Even here at the center, it's it's a known, I make it well known to students that the meaning of this center is to support American Indian students, but every student on campus, every person in the community is welcome here. The more that we illustrate the right way to do it, hopefully the younger communities will follow our example more than our words. Because like I said, you can take away the legal red line that does not remove the internal red line that many of our communities adhere to and, and embrace. We need to break that fear that they need to embrace this alienation. Thank you, Francie. Um, Subiak. Yeah, I personally have not done a lot of work around redlining, but what I have been um, really interested in is on health equity. And that's why, you know, as a policy analyst at Voices Free Talk Children, I focus a lot on children's health and children's health coverage. And there is a report from the Office of Health Disparities uh, that outlines health disparities by legislative districts that I wanted to share because I think it's super valuable to the conversation that we're having today on redlining because we can see that the same uh, neighborhoods that were redlined um, are the same neighborhoods that have higher rates of chronic illnesses, that have higher rates of mortality for infants, that have higher rates of um, just health disparities in general. And health disparities are, you know, disparities in health that could have been um, changed or aren't necessary. And, you know, the work that I do really has focused on um, at Voices on the social determinants of health. And those are the things um, the conditions of the environments where people are born, where people learn, where people live, where people worship. Um, and those are the things that affect the quality of life. And I think um, the work that I'm doing now is really to, you know, work towards health equity of all communities and why I um, work on policies for children, um, especially, but also community health workers, promotoras, who are really, you know, the like the heart of community uh, who are trying to teach, you know, other community members about resources, opportunities, uh, but then also fight against um, 
just like um, malinformation where, you know, people of color may not be, you know, as um, feel as safe, you know, from the government or from certain entities uh, when we know historically, right, there's been so many things that have gone wrong. And so community health workers have been like a really good license. So a lot of my work recently has been on health equity. Um, and, you know, something that I really love from John Lewis um, is his quote, if not us, then who? If not now, then when? And I think that speaks so much, especially today, while, you know, we are feeling um, in some ways a renewed hope, but also just like this continuation, a uh, drive to fight for equity and justice. Um, because while, you know, one transfer of power is really important, there's so much work to do to um, one heal, but also just change a lot of the practices and policies that we've never really um, acknowledged, right? Like while we acknowledge redlining, there's never been anything that has um, counteracted the uh, the mortgages or like the things that were given right to white Americans that weren't given to black or other people of color right and so while you know when we can talk about um having you know changes in some of the practices we still have right like a lot of people of color who can't afford homes even in the west side or there's a lot of gentrification that happens right when the housing values go up people of color then can't afford those places. And so there's a lot of work we, we have to do. And I'm so excited to continue doing um, to fight for, for our, especially our kids. I think I'm really passionate about kids of color and just knowing that like a third of our population here in Utah is kids, like 800,000, almost 900,000 people are kids. And, you know, while we have a lot of work to do, I think there's a lot of hope, especially for our future. Thank you, Sidiak. Um... Uh, it's actually your age group that gives me hope. So that's sort of a generational gap there. So um, but yeah, thank you for that. Okay, but Tima and Ashley, um, other news headlines have been Cleveland neighborhoods redlined in the 1930s are the same ones dealing with lead, sexual assault, poverty, and poor internet issues today. Um, another study Tampa Bay homes in once redlined neighborhoods worth half those in other areas. Um, and a third, in Baltimore, the gap between white and black home ownership still persists. What have long-term, what, what have been long-term impacts of redlining in our community and also in our society? So Fatima. Yes, um, so as we know, structural racism has prevented uh, many communities of color to um, really be part of societies and, and the economy. Um, also, like in general, it has manifested in so many other ways of creating separation within institution. Um, I also recently, I read an article um, on a couple that was trying to sell their home in Michigan and um, when they put up for appraisal, because they were people of color, their appraisal came down way lower than their neighbor, than their neighbor who is white that was selling the same neighborhood, like literally door to door, and their appraisal came up at higher rate. And so we can see some of these um, long-term effects. Um, and I think structurally, we need to evaluate some of the things that are being done by banks, mortgages, real estate, all these things that are affecting communities of color from prospering and living, you know, a good thriving to educate their children to grow out of poverty, to come out uh, stronger. Um, how do we basically um, fundamentally evaluate some of the things that have affected people of color, brown people, um, black people from moving forward? How do we actively reinforce some of the segregation that has impacted them uh, for a very long time? And so I think we just need to ask ourselves, is this a partisan issue? What do we do going forward? It really shouldn't be a partisan issue. It should be an ongoing conversation that we're having on racial inequalities, racial injustice, um, fixing some of the barriers today, as you guys have seen, the um, having our very first uh, woman of color being our vice pre president, having Joe Biden coming uh, you know, on top of things, reminding ourselves why it's important to 
get into action, you know, be part of these good trouble because it will paint the future for many of the younger generation like ourselves. We're not going to be here in this position for a very long time. We need to pass the baton. And how do we do that? How do we come forward and um, work around voting rights, employment, health disparities, um, as well as uh, change some of the um, backlash and experiences of Black communities and people of color going forward. Thank you, Fatima. And Ashley. Thank you. And thank you again so much for inviting me to serve on this panel. It's been a really, really enlightening and um, it's been a conversation that, you know, needs to happen more often, you know, we have to be more vulnerable and have these conversations and see each other, you know, from all of our backgrounds and all of our struggles. When I think about what the impact is for our society um, and for people like Syriac and my child and the generations coming before us, we are going to see a larger gap in the things that we are supposed to admire as this country. You know, we will see a larger gaps in life when we look at redlining and the disparities that, that come and happen between uh, zip codes in regards to health. You know, just here in Salt Lake City, there's a 10 year age, um, there's a 10 year life expectancy gap between the east side and the west side. When we think about pursuit of life, we need to look at pursuit of uh, having a healthy life and not dying sooner than other people in other communities. When I think about liberty, the pursuit of education and per, uh, participating in this economy, that is going to be continue to be an issue when our wealth gap is continues to increase and in, you know um, opportunities to be able to buy a home and participate um, in home ownership on stolen land is not available to us. Um, those same opportunities to buy a home allow people to send their kids to college. And right now, African American women are the are the African American women are the ones who hold the highest amount of education and student loan debt. But we are still the ones who are graduating from um, university and edu educational institutions um, at a higher rate than everyone else these days. Um, when I look at the you know the pursuit of justice in our society, we're going to continue to see an increase um, in you know, incarceration for black and indigenous people of color. Our school to prison pipeline is going to get broader if we don't look at you know, what happens when you don't provide resources to all communities equally. Safer communities aren't the ones who are policed the most, they are the ones who that have adequate resources. Um, and then when we look at the environment, we're going to have, you know, more disparities in that regard. Um, the environment and climate change are going to continue to be a persisting issue. And if we don't look at how to cool those um, effects, how to make transportation more equitable for everyone, how to um, make sure that access to recreation and healthy biodiverse environments are near everyone and all um, residents and children in cities and states, we're going to see, you know, more of an impact towards the negative side if we don't get involved and, you know, participate in some good trouble because good trouble does exist. I see it here on this panel. I'm seeing it more with uh, my colleagues and I'm seeing it more in my community. You know, we, we have to be what we aim, what we set out to be as a society, which is a society that takes care of everyone. And that includes highlighting people who are underrepresented and underserved. Thank you so much, um, Ashley. Um, I'll also just add to this question some, some things that I've seen when we think about environmental racism. Um, and we look at the inland port, we look at um, just the air quality in general in Salt Lake City and the um, higher rates of asthma that children have in, um, in areas in the bottom of the valley. Um, and then in addition to that, it also makes me think about decisions made like, um, which, which doesn't point directly to redlining, but definitely it's a, um, it comes from the same kind of um, belief and attitude. And that is that uh, uh, there's not um, a high school in the west side of Salt Lake except West High, but that's for far north um, and not that far west. But there are um, 1300 students bused um, in normal times on a daily basis to 
um, East High and Highland High every day. And these are kids, who, you know, who live, have an experience whose parents um, say, or, or teachers don't believe their parents are very involved in their education um, and they can't get there, right? They don't ha necessarily have access to good transportation or to vehicles themselves. And so they can't be in, go to the schools to meet with teachers and so on and so forth. And um, and so what are, what, what are the kinds of decisions that have been made historically that have impacted us geographically um, and just um, equitably in general, I think is something that um, we, we really have to work on uh, across all of our institutions and systems. Um, so we have some questions from our audience here. So um, I think what we'll, I'll do is I'll ask a question and then um, invite any of you to, to just unmute yourselves and speak um, to the question. So the first one is, how important is it to legally remove discriminatory language from real estate documents, um, though the discrimination would be illegal, so um, is, it might not be enforced. So would any of you like to speak to that? Okay, I'll, oh, I'll, okay, I'll take a stab at it. Um, normally, it's what these look like are deed restrictions. And so what I've seen in, in, in my practice as the planner, I haven't come um, across it very often, although I have seen it, is um, there'll be a deed restriction attached to a piece of property. When someone wants to change the zoning or the property, or a type of use on the property or do anything really that involves the city and bringing um, the property up to code or um, transitioning things about the property, that's usually when something like that can be um, addressed. And we still suffer from fairly significant gerrymandering that doesn't give equal vote, equal voice to all people in the community. Great, thank you, Francie. Um, all right, let's move on to, there's some great questions here. So um, uh, this one I think is really uh, present in Salt Lake City right now, particularly, but how do you think gentrification impacts areas that were formerly redlined? Fatima, I'm kind of looking at you. I know you can't tell. <laughs> I was like, everybody's just staring and glaring. Um, so there's a lot of development happening throughout Salt Lake City, um, as we can see specifically in uh, areas where largely are, um, are lived by minorities, right? And a lot of time they're pushed out and they have to go further and further away um, and opportunities that they would that would be available to them is no longer available because they can't afford, because they can't be in those neighborhood, they're having to go outside of that realm. And so currently the trends that we're seeing is um, some of these um, housing, you know, giving them um, discounts or low income and, uh, and still they're smaller. And so if they have large families, they still can't be in those small unit apartments that are two bedroom and all of a sudden the square footages are cut shorter. They don't have any means of supporting their children and large families. And so uh, I think this is something that needs to be <clears throat> ultimately discussed with housing authorities, with various institutions and making um, the voices of these minorities and families that are constantly being told, you can't live here anymore. You can't go to this school district because you no longer fit into the everyday lives of what we're trying to you know, do with these uh, cities. Um, I think this is an ongoing conversation we're having. Some of the <clears throat> The question, I'm sorry, I don't know why I'm coughing and all, but um, some of the thing that there was a question about food desert and we've seen during this uh, uh, COVID-19 and the minority communities, um, food banks having to provide odd hours to communities to come, you know, uh, open school for them to pick up lunches and breakfast because families are working essential jobs and they're unable to feed their families. This is an ongoing conversation. So at the city, we have a food equity policy personnel that has really listed a list of these resources and really tried to evaluate some of our
our policies and making sure that we're not leaving any communities out of the conversation and we're relying on what they need rather than us giving out a handout because handouts don't work. Handouts don't necessarily um, give people the opportunity to thrive and become better citizens within their communities. Um, so this is an ongoing um, conversation. I don't think we have um, the right answers and gentrification is happening throughout the valley, but Salt Lake City is definitely seeing a big impact around gentrification. Thank you. Um, this next question um, uh, I think is, uh, speaks a lot to, again, back to sort of that belief and attitude. Um, so working in lending, I've seen these implicit biases that exist in giving access to capital through lending. If we continue to live in a society that is centered around obtaining capital to sustain a good life, what way do you think is best to overcome these implicit biases and provide access to capital to people who experience prejudice? Who would like to take that? I can uh, just say a little bit. Um, I, I think we have to acknowledge first that these implicit bias and racism don't just exist in like one one space or just like you know one lending practice, but in the whole system. Um, and there's a lot that we have to do. Um, the first, of course, is acknowledgement that these that it exists, that we have implicit biases, all of us, um, that we have all you know uh, we have to re rethink and reimagine the way that we talk about people and how we understand um, the history of. Um, just like all of us as a nation, um, especially when it comes to discrimination and racism and acknowledge all of these past um, things when we think, when, you know, we are doing our job, when we are living and existing um, in, in the places that we do. So I, I do think there is a lot that needs to be done um, in, in spaces that, you know, engage with families, engage with people um, in, you know, talking to, in having, you know, an actual person, you know, go through trainings, not just one, not just two, but like continuous trainings on what does uh, racial discrimination look like um, in the workplace? Um, how does it, you know, manifest itself when you are talking to families or when, you know, lenders are talking to families? And again, it's not just, you know, home lenders or people who are working in housing, but in, in all parts of our lives. But we also have to look internally um, in our own organizations. I think that's one of the key, key factors, right? Like if there are no people of color, if there are no people of diverse backgrounds in your, you know, own organ or own organizations or you're not trading them nicely or kindly or in the way that um, actually acknowledges, right, like the, the inequalities, um, then that's just as discriminatory as if you have um, like people who, who have never, you know, acknowledged um, racism in, in the practices that they do. And so I think there's a lot that needs to be done. Um, but first, and foremost, looking internally, you know, having, you know, conversations about race, racism, um, and discrimination in your own organization, own businesses, and then also continuous trainings on um, what can be done and how to, how to speak about the history and discriminatory practices that were before, um, and how that, you know, plays out in the way that, you know, you, you talk to people or you talk to families. Thank you. Um, another question, uh, what is something that students can do to combat the effects of redlining? Um, I'm going to chime in here. Um, so I, when I was a grad student at the U, I participated in something called the Binion Center. And the Binion Center was really great at getting us out into the community and off of campus to participate in uh, things that are going on in our community. Anything from, you know, participating in a community garden to helping out at a school. I think it would be really great if um, there was some type of pipeline to support our students in getting involved with community councils and understanding planning commission and going to their city getting to know their city council members and things of that nature um, because a lot of times when I speak with younger people in my community and the city that I work for um, they're quite intimidated by the entire process of civic engagement um, not just from 
you know, the aspect of, you know, just needing pure education on it because they're, they're university students. They're very smart and capable and bright and can do tons of stuff. Um, so it, it's more so of, of feeling comfortable in a space that seems very professional and might not be um, inclusive of them being, uh, you know, LGBTQIA, indigenous, English language learner, um, even mothers who are students. Um, so I think that's one way that students could get involved in the whole conversation about redlining. Um, if you don't have the time, I would highly suggest reading publications that talk about just city planning and housing and environment just in general. Um, there are some great recommendations that are out there if you just hop on Google. Um, and don't be afraid to sit on your community council. They usually meet once a month and you know they provide a, a lot of insight into what's going on in your neighborhood and how you can directly um, have an impact on ordinances and zoning actively seek to create coalitions. Jan if January 6th taught us nothing, it's sometimes frightening and dangerous to be the only one speaking out. But if you can surround yourself with like thinking people, you're less likely to, to face repercussions. Um, I also to, oh, sorry, Fatima. <laughs> I also wanted to give a plug to the Hinckley Institute of Politics. I did an internship with them in DC, and I know that they have a, a ton of different internships um, here in Salt Lake, where you can get involved either at the legislative session, like right now, there are legislative interns who, you know, talk about local issues, um, you know, while not, it's not exclusively, right, redlining, but it is about what is affecting our local communities. Uh, and then also they have internships at local organizations like Unidades Unidas, Holy Cross Ministries, uh, local organizations who are working with communities of color, grassroots um, efforts that are working towards um, bettering our communities. So just wanted to give a plug there that the um, internship opportunities are amazing um, if you wanna get involved, but also want to um, get some professional experiences. I was gonna just add additionally with internship, um, volunteering and sort of getting connected with organizations like the Hinckley Institute, um, some of the programs like the Benyon Center. Um, there are TRIO program at the University of Utah, the University uh, Par U UNP, University Neighborhood Partners is another great organization to really connect with students and communities of color from West Side, as you guys see, um, Jenny, Mayor Glenn here um, is the director of UNP. Um, there are so many opportunities that are outlined. Um, I think one of the things that I would like to plug in is volunteer, mentor mm -hmm. students of color, volunteer and get connected with individuals from minority communities, really hear their lens and their story from their own perspective, rather than what you hear from the media, what you, uh, you know, hear about them from other communities or what's written about them and the history and the context when you meet the individual and they tell you how they've been traumatized and how trauma has infected them for moving forward. Um, we run a volunteer program called the Know Your Neighbor. Um, if you wanna get connected with refugees and immigrants, that's one way to uh, meet communities who are coming to the United States, new Americans. Um, they need help with citizenship, they need help with language, or they just need help with employment. You can connect to the resources and provide access to equitable, um, you know, everything that they're struggling with, you can pave the way, you can be that individual that they rely on and they call you um, rather when they're facing these troubles and these challenging times. Um, so there are many other ways that you can get connected with ethnic minority, faith-based organizations another way, go to different um, churches, mosques, synagogues, and meet with these uh, communities and understand what they're doing to impact their communities, to empower their communities, and how do you get involved as a student to move forward um, their message with what they're trying to do. Thank you. Um, there's one more, uh, we're, we're about five minutes away from ending here, and there is one more question here that I thought we could touch on, and I actually think it's the beginning of another conversation that um, we ought to be having someday, but um, so the question really says, um, what do you think about what Gregory Squires says, and this is what Gregory Squires says, where different groups of people live, and the homes in which they live are not simply neutral or random demographic phenomena. They profoundly influence the allocation of rewards in the United States. 
Um, this also makes me think of the conversation that, uh, a, that a lot of folks are having around reparations. I'm just wondering if there's anyone who wants to speak to um, the to to this concept. I'll try and uh, touch on that. Um, when I think about, um, you know, zoning and how cities and states and regions are laid out in regards to housing and the rewards you get from that, um, I think about, you know, pretty much how this this nation was formed, the identity in which shaped this country, you know, when we, we physically look at the urban form, right? We have manors and estates that support very heteronormative households and things of that nature. When you support things like that, um, that provides awards towards property taxes that get input into your schools, that allow you tax breaks and incentives, um, that really push a narrative that this type of lifestyle is what is rewarded and accepted. These types of ideologies and practices in this household are what can be protected, not just from a safety standpoint, environmental standpoint, even a historic standpoint, Mike. When we look at historic neighborhoods, right, they're typically not uh, non-white neighborhoods. We have very few historic Black neighborhoods. We have very few historic Indigenous people neighborhoods. We have very, very, very few senses of, of, of self and identity when you go around a city and say, this is the place. These people were here. And that's an award that they receive from this society. So when I think about people who inhabit a space, the narrative that's um, built around that historically um, is what's uh, provided um, in these households, in these homes. You know, they, they hold a history. Homes hold a history. And if, unfortunately, if you have been a renter or lived in an affordable housing complex, you're seen as transient. And, uh, you know, even being someone who experiences homelessness, you aren't deemed um, you know, respectable in a sense, if you were to even speak out on issues that are uh, facing you, particularly that are very hard struggles. So I think respect is unfortunately a reward system that, mm -hmm. you know, our urban form has supported. Thank you, Ashley. Um, I, in the last couple of minutes, I just want to see if there are any other comments from the panelists. Um, anything else that you feel like would like to say. I'd just like to thank my co-panelists. This has been amazing. I'm really appreciative of being included in this and allowed. One last thing I want to throw in is I ask everybody to open your minds up a little bit. I was sitting on a committee once and they were talking about a museum and getting in less, uh, a, a more diverse group of students and children coming in. And one of the committee members said, well, we already have two free days a year. And I said, have you considered that the students on the west side of the tracks, how do they get here? Who takes care of the rest of the family? What if the parents have to work on those two days? Who's going to feed them when they're here? What are the, what benefits do they have? What equipment do they have to support their environment and their experience here? We need to think wider. But thank you again, Mayesh. Well, and I guess we'll turn it over to you, Lori. Thank you. Thank you so much. I want to thank you, wonderful moderator Jenny. Thank you, and our panelists. We very, very much appreciate your time, your wisdom, your inspiration. Um, it was, it, this was a really, really wonderful conversation and I know it's not the end. Um, it's the beginning to many more discussions. So thank you very much. We do also thank the Hinckley Institute of Politics for being our partner with this Reframing the Conversations. And we hope that um, our participants and others can join us for more Martin Luther King Week uh, celebration events. We have the website I was noting is right above us on many of our, our wallpaper behind us, diversity.utah.edu slash MLK has information 
about our upcoming events. We've got a film screening today of Mossville. We've got a book review tomorrow morning with Dean Crunk Warner, um, some really wonderful other events um, that can be perhaps accessible virtually from many places. So we also would like to have you mark your calendars for next month's Reframing the Conversation. That will be on February 10th and information and details will also be on the diversity.utah.edu website as those develop. Thank you again for everything. Thank you so much to the staff who have uh, made this possible and uh, we very much appreciate your participation. Take care. And I think now we can um, leave. Again, thank you so much. Thank you very much all for uh, supporting you. us on this panel and helping us uh, uh, have this great event. We really appreciate your time. Thank you for everything. Thank Thanks you. So it was nice meeting you all. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.